season began in Miami, where Sam Hornis Jr. stormed past Team Penske. Outside, outside, clear. The combatants headed to the desert for round two, but this time the one-two Penske punch captured the top two spots, climbing to victory. Round three in Fontana and Jacques Lazier joined the fight. Now coming for the line, checkered flag is out, and it's Hornet, Hornet by just three feet. Will there be another new contender today in Nazareth? Round four is next. <laughs> Speedway in Pennsylvania, ABC Sports presents the Firestone Indy 225 for the Indy Racing League. The cars are on the racetrack, warming up, getting set for the green flag. Hi, everyone. I'm Bob Jenkins, your host for all IRL events this year, and we have come to the fourth stop of the season. This is the first time the IRL has ever competed here. It is a very cloudy and overcast day, and there is a chance of rain. It's the final event before the Indianapolis 500, but that will be contested on the expansive two-and-a-half-mile Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Here at Nazareth, well, it's an oddly shaped racetrack that measures a little less than a mile. The turns are all of different radius. There is a 34-foot elevation change, and it's a difficult track to set up for, but Gary Gerald, one team, has apparently figured it out. That's the Penske team, and Bob, while they may be newcomers this year to the IRL, they're no strangers to this racetrack. In fact, their headquarters is only a 45-minute drive away, and over the years, their drivers have put in thousands of miles of testing and competition, and in fact, have won here six times. Jill DeFerrin, Elio Castroneves, side by side in the front row, and Jack Arut, they've been fast all weekend. They are clearly the team to beat. They may have home field advantage, Gary, but if you want to talk about a team with momentum, you've got to look right behind that front row to Team Menard and Jacques Lazier. They stumbled early out of the IRL season's box, but at California, they battled back, and they battled back again today disqualified third. Their focus has been and continues to be on the Indianapolis 500 and the ball page. A good finish today will stand well for them when Indy opens in just 10 days. Well, you have to ask any of these drivers, they all agree it's a very tricky track. There are a couple other words, patience and perseverance. That's how you're going to win here today, but it's not quite that easy. That's opposition to what a race driver normally does. Sarah Fisher is back. She's subbing for Robbie Buell, and along with six others, the first time she ever saw or practiced on this track was last Tuesday. And, Paul, this track is difficult enough for the veterans in perfect weather conditions. With the cold temperatures today, tires will be an issue for all drivers, especially the rookies. They have to have some tire temps in the car so they don't lose grip and get into that big wall. Now, they qualified at nearly 88 degrees. The front row, all Team Penske. Jill DeFerrin with his first pull. Catherine Nevis on the outside. In row two, it's Jacques Lazier and the great rookie Thomas Schechter. Philippe Giafone and Buddy Lazier make up the third row in the fourth row. It's Laurent Redon and Sam Hornish Jr. George Mack is inside row five. Alex Barron to the outside. It's Scott Sharp and Billy Boat in row six. In the seventh row, Shigeaki Hattori and Anthony Lazaro, who's won here in Atlantic. Eddie Cheever Jr., Jeff Ward, that's row eight. The ninth row, Ayrton Dare and Rick Treadway. In row 10, Sarah Fisher and Robbie McGee. Back in the 11th row, Al Unser Jr. and Richie Hearn. Al Unser Jr., Team Kelly, had a surprise birthday party for him on Friday. Believe it or not, Junior is now 40. In row 12, John Herb and John DeVries, but DeVries decided with very limited practice time, it was not prudent of him to start today. They've withdrawn the car. As we look at the weather graphic, you can see the air and track temperature, a drop of almost 30 degrees from when we start testing here on Friday. The cold temperatures, as we mentioned for the tires, will be the issue. Field lined up on the downhill backstretch, heading into turn three. They're coming toward the green flag. DeFerrin, Elio Castro Nevis, and here they go. They gave a nice warm up because of cold temperature. Green flag is out. They got six whole laps of warm up before they went green. And Paul, you can see.
see all the drivers did the smart thing. They got in single file from the start, not trying to challenge each other for the turn. After about five or ten laps, the tire temperatures will start to come up, and they'll start to lean on the cars just a little bit more. The race cannot be won in the first turn or first lap. And, fellas, that is one of the things that was preached at the driver's meeting. Brian Barnhart just said 1992 Indianapolis 500. That was when cold weather affected starts and restarts as Jacques Lazier tried the inside of one of the Team Marlboro cars. And he said, remember, cautions will breed cautions. Use your head. And speaking of caution, caution comes out. That was DeFerrin, then Castro Nevis, then Jacques Lazier. Now, we had an indication on the electronic system of a caution, but it's a false indicator. We assume it did not go to the cars, though we use the same system that they do with the special light telemetry on board the car. And that system, Paul, is a very good point because the system that we use in the box up here is in every driver's car. That was implemented by RRL a few years ago to let the drivers know if there is an indication of problems on the racetrack. They can see it before they might get to it if it's a turn or two ahead. So at the front, it's still to fair and Catherine Evans, the second. Jock Lazier is working very hard on him. Thomas Schechter sits just behind Lazier. And Philippe Giafone sits in fifth place right now. The team certainly keeping an eye as are we to the sky. Because the real question is, will rain move in to the Nazareth area? Will they be able to run a full race? 113 laps would be a legally complete race. 225 is the scheduled distance. And that will come into play in the pit lane with everybody doing their strategy if things look like the weather is going to get worse. Come lap 60 or 70, everybody in pit road will start to look up to the sky. They'll be checking the computers in the pit box, looking on the weather channel to see what's happening in the local area. And guys, we're already hearing that some of the teams told us just prior to Green that they would consider trying to gain track position with a short fill on that first stop, gambling that that weather might roll in. So a lot of strategic uh, things to be figured out as we now get settled into a nice race rhythm. Sam Horney started eight, dropped back a position, now behind Alex Barron, and trying to work his way forward. But of course, when you're talking Nazareth, as we look back to the lead, and they begin to encounter the back of the field for the first time. The trick here is it to the race car is virtually a circle, which makes it very tough to pass. The track is very busy, Paul, as we mentioned. You're always turning. It's less than a mile. There's four distinctly different turns at this racetrack. Very difficult to get your race car set up for a perfect lap. Now, as they come up to traffic right now, remember, tires are just starting to come up to temps. They don't want to go off the racing line too much. They're hoping the driver in front, they're trying to pass, will look in the mirror and see them, or they'll get indications from their spotters. As they come up, that's John Hurd, the line just ahead of the leader, Dill DeFerrin, and then Richie Hearn in the blue and white car, normally occupied by LSAO Salazar, but he was involved in a very serious accident in Indianapolis, hospitalized. They did surgery. He is out of the hospital, back to his home in Miami, but it's going to be a very long recovery, and we wish our best to Eliseo Salazar. On board with Jacques Lazier. There comes Schechter closing in as they work around John Herb and George Mack, giving his car a great ride as he comes up into this fight, too. Buddy Lazier moving to the front, currently fifth now. Consider this when you consider Marlboro Team Penske, starting with their performance in IRL at the Indy 500 last year. They have always finished in adjacent positions. And they're doing the same thing now, Paul. Interesting to see, they've already picked up where they want to run today. It's the low line in all the turns. Drivers will try and see where their car's working best, whether it's going to be low or whether it's going to be high. The leaders right now are starting to demand the lower line and get underneath traffic, especially into turn three. Going back now, Sam Hornet runs in ninth. And he's trying to move on and get around the Hollywood car, Philippe Giafone, number 21, just ahead of him. Now, Paul, we know Sam Hornish as we see him trying to run the outside. Giafone going through turn two. You saw the wheel in his hand start to go around and move underneath him. It's a very bumpy section in turn two. The car comes out from underneath you a little bit in perfect conditions. In traffic, he's getting the dirty air from the car in front of him. And you see this group of car up in front of him right here, giving him a lot of dirty air for the aerodynamics of his car. Very difficult to get some good steering as he's trying to get underneath 
all the traffic and make a clean run down here to three. Well, as you John saw them five. come off of that bump in turn two, you saw John Herb, number 16 car, really bounce at the back end of the car, and that's what they have to contend with. So now the field slows, and that's George Mack. We just mentioned him. He had a great qualifying. Now, Thanks. Brian Barnhart, who is the director of racing operations here, said to the drivers in the drivers' meeting, you get on the grass, regardless of the car condition, we're going to yeah, pull you out of the, out of the race because they're very worried about crossing that grass and getting up into traffic. Absolutely. It's a difficult situation here. I believe that he was still on the racetrack, so that rule may not apply. It applies for when you're coming out of the pit lane. But let's have a look at it here. Yep. Going through the turn. Looks like he's coming out of four. The back end just got out from underneath him. And you can see right here, the car's already started to go around and go towards the wall. Very lucky he has not hit anything. Did the right thing, getting on the brakes just as it goes into the infield. He let the car come across the track. See, the car's already starting to come around behind him. He's got opposite lock in. He's trying to catch it, and the car just goes around. Now, why did this happen? He was in behind about three or four different cars, getting a lot of dirty air, loss of downforce, and the back end slid around from him. So the first caution of the day with Jill DeFerrin jumping from the pole to the lead. His teammate Catherine Evans is in second, and Jacques Lazier sits now in third. We'll be back. Well, we ran 16 laps without a caution, but George Mack spun down in turn number four and did bring out the first caution of the day. As you can see, his car has made it back to pit row. They're checking over. He did not hit anything. The car just did a spin out in turn number four. We can't emphasize enough how weird this racetrack is and how the drivers have a challenge. It's a very challenging racetrack, very tight. There's really no chance to relax, just a little bit in the back, possibly. If you can get turn three quick, then you should have a real quick lap all around. It's tough to get the car working in both turns two and turn three. We run a lot of downforce, and then when you ride behind the other guy, you just lose a lot of the downforce. The size of the track, it's really small, so basically we're going to be in traffic every lap, all the time. The fact that it's so tight and there are so many blind corners that you're going into at about 180 miles an hour, and the fact that there's a lot of elevation changes makes it unique. On board with Al Unser Jr. as he comes in for a pit stop, and he really benefited perhaps the most from this caution because he was just about to go a lap down when the caution came out. But now he and the others have a chance to come in and get some pit work done and go back out for some more racing. Well, the first 16 laps of this race saw a lot of good competition up front, and of course we did see some lapping of the field as uh, the faster cars begin to catch the others, and that's what we'll look for all day, is the traffic will indeed play a very huge role in the activity here at Nazareth Speedway. The Indianapolis 500-mile race is coming up, and our coverage begins on Saturday, May the 11th. That will be the day that they run for the pole position for the 86th running of the Indianapolis 500. That's Scott Sharps on board camera as he warms up his tires and gets set for the restart. Here at Nazareth, we have completed 21 laps now. Jill DeFerrin, Elio Castroneves, Jacques Lazier, Thomas Schechter, and Buddy Lazier are shown as the top five. And Scott George Mack, very lucky that he did not hit anything and is going to be able to get back into competition. Well, he's very lucky. Anytime you spin at a one-mile track, especially here at Nazareth, if you don't hit the wall. Oh, speaking of trouble. There you go. Cold Laurent tires, Redon. possibly again. Laurent Redon. Two rookies we've had the problems with here, guys. We talked about that at the beginning of the show. In fact, let's get into that whole situation, because remember 91 Indianapolis, the cold tires, even when you're going slow, the tires are no now contact, cooling Laurent. off. You got some, oh, our 92 Indianapolis, you've, you've got some serious considerations on a restart. Absolutely. We talked about the tires. Tires are trying to, are built to be working in conditions of 85 to 90 degrees for optimum type of temperatures right now. 
we do not have a situation here today where we'll see those type of temperatures. Drivers are going to have to be very diligent on spinning the tires on restarts to get some heat into them, almost like a drag car, to get ready for the restarts. 22 laps completed of the 225 in the Firestone Indy 225. Gilles DeFerrin is at the front. Ready to go back to green flag racing in the Firestone Indy 225. It is a very cool day here. Paul, look at the track temperature, 57 degrees. Track temperature always usually around 80 to 100 degrees to make those tires work. As we mentioned just before we got off for commercial, the drivers now would be spinning their tires on acceleration, coming up to the restart to try and get some heat in them so the back end of the car won't slide around, which is the two instances that we've seen so far today. George Mack, Loren Redon will both be able to continue on in competition. Speed comes up, Jill DeFerrin on point. Elio Castroneva second, Jacques Lazier third as they come back to the green flag. There's how they came back to the green. Now both Lazier and Thomas Decker trying to close on Elio Castroneva. Thomas Schechter is reporting in during that caution. The car is just a tad loose. They asked him if they wanted to make a change. He said, no, the track will come to us. So, so far, this rookie likes what he sees from his Red Bull entry. Yeah, that's a veteran-like comment. It certainly is. Usually when a car's a little bit loose, the driver's just trying to stop the back end from going around on him, much like we've seen here in the two instances already today. Thomas Schechter, as Eddie has said before, his teammate and boss, boy, he likes to run a car loose and on the edge. Thomas Schechter, when he was talking about this track, said that it's interesting, it's very much like a road course because of all the different moments of roll at the race car and the driver's seat throughout the run. So I guess given that, those with extensive road racing experience might have a slight advantage here. On board Lazier. Absolutely, as we're on board with Lazier right now, a little bit of moisture on his lens. We're not sure if that's precipitation coming from uh, the rain or if that's actually something coming off the cars that are in front of him. But getting back to Thomas Schechter, he's used to running road courses. This is only his fourth oval track experience that he's ever had, and you must say he's doing a great job. One of the things that Jacques Lazier talked about was the fact that if this racetrack had just four more feet, Jacques Lazier said it would stop being a roller coaster and it would be a side-by-side -side opportunity for cars. So when he was queried as to, well, does that mean that you can't pass? He said, no, you just have to pick your passes. And Jacques told me, he says, what you can't do is pass more than one car at one time. He said, that's what sometimes can be very frustrating. Back on board with Jacques Lazier. Now, let's listen to him for a bit, Scott, because he's into the limiter. As he gets the run here from turn two down to turn three, probably the quickest place in the racetrack, and the limiter you heard right there. He could be running in fifth gear, not using sixth right now. Six might be a fuel strategy gear, as we call it, just a longer gear to make the RPMs lower in the engine to conserve fuel. Or if they've chosen the sixth gear that he's running in right now, it could be a situation like we saw earlier in the year with Sam Hornish where he's just not going to get any more speed out of the car. And you look from the John Vanville car up through third, second, and first, and you can see already that Jill DeFerrin is the leader, is beginning to overlap the field once again. Some cars on the move, though everybody is being careful. Billy Boat went from 12th to 10th. Jeff Ward went from 16th to 9th. And Alex Barron moving around. Sam Hornish on the early lap went from 10th to 8th. Gary Gerald. Paul, it's interesting as you watch DeFerrin start to get into that traffic scenario, the man that normally in his ear as his spotter, Rick Mears, is not here this weekend. Oh, oh problem. And that is Lazier. Buddy Lazier catches the wall with the right side, and Hornish, Hornish is in trouble too. Think of that in terms of the battle between up, you Penske and Panther. Just before we saw Lazier hit the wall, Hornish in that big mass of traffic touched the back of Lazier's car, stuck him into the wall, and you can see the damage from the front of Sam Hornish's car from that impact. You know, you talk about this track, how tricky. You talk about patience. 
and to see two great champions like Lazier and Hornish get involved this early on. That's a shock. And Buddy knows it. You saw him throw his steering wheel into the cockpit. Probably giving a wave to Sam on the way by. Just a busy part of the racetrack. Four cars wide. Everybody trying to get by. Now Hornish is going to bring it back into the pits. We'll keep track of this while we see what happened. Now here you see them four wide. Sam's trying to get himself through. Over here by the wall in between. Lazier and also the wall is not going to work. A lot of traffic coming down. See the touching that's going on there? Boys, I got to tell you, Sam Hornish was in too much of a rush too early in this race. And what was suggested just a moment ago, everybody's trying to move around the 34 MyJack car of Laurent Redon. Giofoni did it on the low side, but then they got bottled up on the outside. Everybody wants to get down and get into the single line going into turn three. This racetrack is really a single line racetrack when you get to the middle of the turns. But you can see now he's going to move himself to the right hand side. Guys, that's just not enough room. It's not going to happen. There's the touch bending the left front suspension of Hornish's car, unfortunately putting Buddy Lazier into the wall. Oh, he would have been a champ if he could have gotten it done. But as Danny Sullivan has said so many times, there's only one letter difference between Sam and Trump car behind the wall. Sam's still in the car, though. I wonder if they're thinking about it. They have such an incredible, the back end down. incredible record of consistency. 99.4% finishing consistency for Sam Hornish since he started racing for Panther Racing. Pits are now open. And Paul, both the Penske teams are laid out for DeFerrin and Castro Nevis. And if it's a case of follow the leader, they're a little over halfway through this fuel run. I would imagine most everybody will follow them. Some may gamble for track position. Well, Jacques Lazier is certainly going to follow him in. In fact, most of the field going to follow the leader. DeFerrin hits his marks. Castro Nevis was trying to rush to his pit, had to lock up the brakes. We watched Jill DeFerrin. Wing change on both sides. Go, 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 go. Castro Nevis in a drag race. Jill beats Elio out. And Gary, they just go by Jacques Lazier as the work continues on the Team Menard car, trying to take a full load of fuel. And it looked as if they weren't getting the kind of fuel they want. This is way longer than they need to be. Oh, this is not good for Jacques Lazier. They're not getting the fuel in. Part of the problem is they the hose is extended too far away. And now, the frustration can be seen because they cannot get it attached. Jacques Lazier is fitted about a foot and a half too far outside the box. They finally pull the car in. They make the connection. Lazier wants to see the lap down. Oh, this is costly, Scott. Absolutely. You saw from the monitor we marked where the car need to be. The left front wheel need to be on the piece of tape. He was about a foot and a half away. Those fuel hoses will not reach the car. Those fuel hoses are as short as possible to make travel time for the fuel coming from the fuel tank into the car as quick as possible. Unfortunately, Jock just was a little bit too wide on pit entry. But there was a lot of dancing during both that stop and up and down the pits. It, it was like they weren't truly prepared. Here comes the Menard car, Jacques Lazier, back on the pit road. And well, you got to remember, the reason is because they did not get a full tank of fuel. 35 gallons of methanol is held in these cars. Let's see if he hits the marks better. Yes, he does, but he's still a little wide of where he should be. They do tap the, they do tap the car off. Shot, I would think that what Jacques Lazier must do is make sure that he doesn't allow his emotions to affect his driving. It's a difficult time. You want to make everything perfect for your guys in the pits. When you come in, you're looking to hit the marks. If you missed by about three or four inches, you can actually get away with it, but that was just too far down to Gary. Rick Reinemann, the veteran who changes and is one of the uh, longtime members of the Penske team, is hobbling as he comes over the wall, and there's concern after he apparently got nicked by Scott Sharp's car on entry to the pits. Reinemann, re right now, saying no medical attention is necessary. They were checking on his... And they're taking a look. Tom Wirtz, the team manager, taking a look at it right now. If you uh, remember that stop, you could see a crew member. We assume Reinemann jumping up and down as the car is exited. They work on Hornish's car. We'll be back. Welcome back to the Firestone Indy 225. Uh, they are still clearing the track. Sam Hornish's car is all the way back in the uh, paddock area. They're doing what work they can on that car. Scott, there have been some other action occurred during the pit stops. 
The pits are always a busy place. If you watch here, you'll see Scott Sharp coming into his pit box. And right there, you can see how his left front wheel is just touching the edge of the pit box and touching the edge of the crew member right behind the leg. Now, it's hard to tell whether or not he was perfectly in line or if that crew member stuck his foot outside of their pit box. Now, here we are with Scott Sharp turning in. Watch his left front wheel right here as he's going towards the crew member sticks his foot out. He's just going to clip his foot a small amount. Now, these are the smallest pit boxes that we visit on the IRL circuit, the only 35 feet in length. Let's go to Gary Gerald. And Rick Reinemann is on the wall. Can you tell us what happened? I don't know. I must have come in close and I uh, got the back of my ankle. I'm fine. You all right? You going to stay working? Absolutely. One tough guy, guys. Yeah, that's an ex-Marine right there. Scott Sharp under caution. Scott Goodyear, you can talk with him. Scott Sharp, Scott Goodyear in the booth. Do you hear us? Yeah, Scott, how are you doing? Very good. Very cold day out there. Cold tire temperatures and a little bit of pit action. What's going on with you? Still, my team, we're hanging in there right now. Um, you know, the traffic is just extremely tough. Uh, you know, it's so hard. It's really pretty much a one-groove track. Once we've run for probably five or six laps, the uh, tires come in pretty good, but it's just uh, turbulence plays a big role in trying to get close enough to a guy that you might be able to get around him. I'm sure cold temperatures on the tire are playing a big part today. Traffic's trouble, and thanks for your report. Four, thanks. Jack Root, you're continuing to watch some work down in the paddock area. And never before, since Sam Hornish started driving for Pennzoil Team Panther, has the crew been forced to take a car behind the wall and go to work. That is exactly what's happening now. Led by Kevin Blanche, the team has gone to work. They have totally replaced the left front suspension pieces, and now they are going back to work trying to reattach all the various items that go down towards the nose of the tub. This is not an easy task, but it is something, Bob Jenkins, that this team has never done before with Sam Hornish Jr. at the controls. So round four will not be a fight between Team Penske and the Pennzoil Panther team because Sam is back in the paddock area with work being done on his car. Remember, he collided with Buddy Lazier a few laps ago, sending Lazier into the outside wall. That's the reason we are under caution right now. Al Unser Jr. and Sarah Fisher did not pit during this uh, sequence of pit stops, and therefore they are at the front of the field right now. Rick Treadway in third position with DeFerrin and Castro Nevis running in third, or rather in the fourth and fifth spot. They, of course, did make pit stops during this caution period. Al Unser Jr., who celebrated his 40th birthday yesterday is at the front log on to espn.com keyword abc irl to check out our new speedcast real-time race results and the irl challenge fantasy game scott sharp is at the back of the field now he's being shown in 16th position just ahead of him is laurent radon who also spun on cold tires earlier in the event, putting him back there. Field is getting realigned. The workout on the racetrack itself has been completed. The cleanup is finished. Meanwhile, Jack Arute is standing by with a driver who is sitting out today's race. The car that Sarah Fisher is driving, the Dryon Rumble Purex style special, is normally driven by this man, Robbie Buell. Robbie, first of all, medically, you now have been cleared to run in the Indianapolis 500, correct? Yeah, no, I...